So if you see your name with the title Mr or Mrs or they use our name in uppercase, this is back to Admiralty Law. The legal fiction is an abstract term to explain a concept and so is the term straw man. We're debt collectors. Um, people assume when a debt collector comes round that uh, they have actual power. They don't. They have no power whatsoever. They only have the power that you give to them. Oh, what do you want, Phil, please? That's don't assault. strike me. I'm not obstructing you. Right. Show us the warrant. So we don't consent. You, yeah. need, you need our consent. Um, that's that's the end of it. Do you mind telling me who you are? I won't tell you anything. So you're a police officer enforcing laws, but you don't know every law, is that right? Yeah, that's right. 90% of the crime, or 99% of the crime they perceive that is crime, is actually called victimless crime. There is no victims, and crime can only exist if there is a victim. You know, we've seen police officers more interested in becoming debt collectors and enforcing policies, you know, such as speeding tickets and, and fines and things like that, because they're easy targets. Once you comprehend the difference between lawful and legal, and ultimately, what your legal fiction straw man is, the fear of debt collectors, police and authority just goes away. If you live in the UK, you are led to believe that the Queen is the only sovereign. This is wrong. The Queen is given authority through the coronation oath. Her oath was a binding contract between the Crown and the people of this nation. This means that we, the people, gave her her sovereignty. And as everyone knows, you can't give away something you do not possess yourself. That means that each and every one of us is sovereign. We each have supreme, independent authority over our own flesh and blood human body. The problem is, we have forgotten we are powerful. We have forgotten that we belong to and are part of one of the most amazing species that to our knowledge has ever existed. We have become media obsessed and in turn obsessed with our own appearance and the way people think about us. The TV is king, but now that is slipping to the constant need to be in touch with our friends. Everything is about fear. Fear of debt, fear of terrorism, fear of ill health, or fear of climate change. This keeps us thinking that we need our government to protect us and rule us. With all this distraction, it is no wonder that most of us didn't notice the massive fraud that our countries and nations around the world have pulled on us. But as you will learn, government is a creation of man, and a creation of man can never be above man. They always need your consent, and this is where your power really lies. With knowledge always comes power, the power not to fear, the power to take a stand against anyone or any corporation that threatens you. The power to say no. It has been said that you need to know that you're in a cage before you can escape from that cage. Let's look into how you're being tricked and how your power is being hidden from you. If you've never heard of the terms legal fiction or straw man, then what you're about to learn is something that sounds so astonishing that it couldn't possibly be true. If I were to tell you that paying your tax, getting a driver's license, registering your car, paying fines and attending court are all optional and that you are conned into agreeing with them, what would you think? All statues and acts are optional too. Your straw man is a fictitious legal entity created at your birth through your birth certificate and the registration of that birth. Okay, my understanding of the legal fiction, uh, which is also referred to as the straw man, uh, the way I explain it when I do talks, I keep it really, really simple. Uh, and what I do, I liken it to a game of Monopoly. 
Now, in a game of Monopoly, you actually have a little token, like a dog or a battleship or a hat, you know, like a little top hat, and you move it around the board. Now, I believe that they actually give us a fictional entity which we can actually use or not use. And I believe this is the, and a lot of other researchers do as well, that this is your name in either uppercase or with a title. That when each person is born, whenever a human being is born, there's two entities. One is the real entity, which is the human being, the flesh and blood. And the other is a legal fiction, a fictional entity that is nothing more than a piece of paper, the birth certificate. Um, again, we're, we're duped into believing that these are one in the same, and so we're tricked into representing the, uh, the legal fiction, the straw man, that birth certificate. So when people get fines and things like that, um, it's actually um, consulting the legal fiction, the, the non-existent entity, the corporate entity, that is owned by corporations. You have any interactions with the bureaucracy, okay? They're not interacting with you, they're actually actually interacting with your with your legal fiction. Because they can't deal with a, with a flesh and blood human, yeah, they have to deal with another corporation. When you start to break down the words that we use and you start to look at the roots of all these words and you actually look at where, where these words, what these words actually really mean, you start to get an idea of what's going on. The word corporation is very, corporation is very, very specific because it's corp and oration, it's dead speak. So a corporation is something that's dead. It's an entity that exists only in a legal framework. It doesn't exist in any other framework at all. It only becomes an entity through legal mechanisms and legal means. In essence, when you were born and far too young to understand, a company with your name was created through your birth certificate. When your parents registered your birth, they actually created a company and handed ownership of that company and you over to the state. It is important to remember that your parents were tricked and had no idea this was happening. This is why the state can take children from their families and it not be classed as kidnapping. They own your child. They own one tenth. Because they registered the child, they have nine tenths, possession is nine tenths of the law but they still, there's one tenth floating about somewhere. And the government have claimed that one tenth. So when the child, because I've had it from social workers, many, at least now, three social workers on separate occasions have come out of audiences and actually said to me, you, you're right in what you're saying is because we have to get the birth certificate within 48 hours of taking the child. And if they can't get the birth certificate, they have to reapply to be able to get the birth certificate. They have to get it because that is proof of who the slave is, what the slave is. And actually, in legal terms, they're actually only entitled to the birth certificate and not the child. To take the child on the pretense that they are this legal personality is theft. So in legal terms, it's kidnapping. But the social services can use legal kidnapping because everything is okay as long as it has the stamp legal applied to it. That includes war, genocide, Anything is okay as long as it's, yep, it's okay, it's legal. The same thing also happens when you register your car. You get a document back saying you are the registered keeper and not the registered owner. So yeah, obviously we've just spoken about registering children and uh, the other thing that we register though is our vehicles. And obviously either of those can allegedly be taken off you at some point in time, which is quite interesting. The two registered items are the things that can be taken. You, you are the registered keeper of your car. You're not the owner, you're the keeper in their eyes. Now they'll argue that point, and a lot of people will argue that point, but it's quite easy to, to, to quell this argument and say, well, okay, if you don't put tax on the car, then they'll come and take your car. Now, in the legal world, taking anything from someone without a legal mechanism to do so is theft. The legal system cannot deal with humans. It can only deal with pieces of paper. Only common law can deal with humans. So at your birth, they created a piece of paper with your name on it, in capitals, 
just like any other corporation. This is done to dupe you later in life into thinking that you are the legal entity and not you. Then imaginary penalties and cost are imposed on the straw man and you, thinking you are it, pay them. Um, and it's, it's kind of like an overcoat, um, this, this legal fiction. Um, you know, as soon as you put it on, as soon as they uh, invite you to put this overcoat on and you, you, you do so, now they can grab hold of the overcoat and throw it in jail with you in it. But um, um, until you put that overcoat on, they can't do anything to you because you are not that name. You know, you think you are, you know, you're taught you are, but you're not. The deception is done through the manipulation of words and language. But that to me is, is, is legalese, it's just jargon that no one really understands and because no one really understands it, no one ever questions it. We, we, we basically have a discussion that everybody is taught incorrect but because everybody is taught incorrect they believe it's correct. Legalese is a whole language of its own, it's a complete legal jargon that's not really designed for anybody to understand it other than those that are supposedly uh, supposed to be enforcing it. Um, and it's something that's so complicated that not even police officers understand what they're saying. What is wonderful is that they create their own language called legalese and it has a completely different interpretation from English. You know, we're supposed to have, uh, you know, this understanding that we were within the law and yet they don't even, they're not even using the same language as we are. The easiest way to understand legalese is to realise that there are many English words that have more than one meaning, depending on whom you are talking to. If I were to ask you what a person was, you'd probably say a human being, but that's you or I. If you were talking to someone in the law society, i.e. a police officer, lawyer, judge, etc., they have a different dictionary to you or I, and person could mean company or corporation, i.e. the legal fiction. You know, if you tell a lie often enough, it becomes truth, or certainly the perception of truth. So legalese is jargon that nobody understands other than those who actually come up with a jargon that, that really, really deeply understand it. And even police officers don't understand it, or magistrates, or even judges for that matter. Tax is probably the best way, the only way better than fractional reserve banking to starve a community is taxation. And it wouldn't be that case if the tax was actually spent on the people and on the, and on the land, but because it's not, it becomes a starving of the people. This is again comes back to corruption. And tax would be fine. We'd be living in an amazing health service, incredible roads, all the rest of it, if all the money that went into the taxation pot was paid for what it was supposed to be for. Um, my understanding is it isn't. The problem that we have is the implications for its non-use is that other than fraud, it's the only debt that can deprive you of your liberty. It's the only debt that it can put you in jail for is tax evasion or tax fraud, um, which is pretty serious really because you can ignore as many credit cards or loans as you like and you can never be put in jail for any of that. But if you try and not pay your tax for a while, they'll really like to let you know about that. Funny thing is, I don't see many representatives of people like Amazon or big corporates that aren't paying their tax in the slammer. Maybe they should be.
income tax in the UK first started in 1799 as a temporary measure to cover the costs of the Napoleonic Wars. It is still a temporary tax today, which expires each year on the 5th of April and has to be renewed as a provision in the annual financial bill. Income tax was withdrawn in 1816, but was re-established in 1842 and has stayed since. Because of this, human beings are the only creatures on the planet that pay to live on it. The government does not own the product of your labor. If they did, you would be a slave. Since they do not own the product of your labor, then taxation can be defined as theft, or more accurately, extortion and blackmail. No man can own another, so no man can own the fruits of another man's labor. Most people will argue that it is a necessary evil and that it's legal because the government say that it is. How else would we pay for hospitals, police, roads and so on? Well, reaching into your own pocket to help a good cause is noble. Reaching into someone else's pocket under the threat of force is despicable. Here is a quick analogy. I run a construction firm and I knock at your door and demand £10,000 to build an extension or I'll take all your stuff and throw you in a cage. Essentially, that's what the government do when they tax you. They say they're going to supply you with services and protect you. But if you don't pay them, just like the Mafia, they are the ones that come after you and use force and violence to get the money out of you. The trouble is, most people never look at these situations from these angles and so rarely see the deception that has constantly been pulled over our eyes. A large percentage of all the tax you pay is used on war, bailing out the banks and paying off the national debt. It has been calculated that 47% of all your income is spent on tax. You work five to six days a week and get to keep 54% of your wages. Then you have to pay for your mortgage or rent, gas, electricity, water, food, clothes, and that's just the basics. No wonder both parents have to work and work constantly, unlike families of just 50 years ago. You are a slave and you're in a metaphorical cage that just like Neo, you cannot touch, taste or smell. A prison created by the mind of man. Governments essentially run human farms and feed you the perception of freedom. Governments do not make money within themselves. The government's primary function is to trick money out of your pocket and feed it into their business so they can carry on with wars, deception and human farming, all in plain sight. They have no lawful basis for whatever they do. There's, uh, you know, they might claim they have a legal basis. Now, legal is a different thing altogether. Um, it's, it's essentially based on contract. You have to contract with them before it becomes law. This is a prison without bars. This is a prison without big walls to keep them in. It's just a prison of the mind. The main implication of not paying tax is that you'll grow a set of balls and you'll turn into an adult. That's the main implication. The three functions of money are distinguished as 1. A store of value or purchasing power the ability of an item to hold value over time. Two, a medium of exchange. Money serves as a medium of exchange, i.e. an asset that the sellers will accept as payment. A medium of exchange allows people to eliminate the use of barter. Three, a unit of accounting, a way of placing a specific price on economical goods and services. As a unit of accounting, the monetary unit is used to measure the value of goods and services relative to other goods and services. Money in its modern form arose from goldsmiths who retain gold and other precious metals in their safes 
and in exchange, they gave certificates to prove the deposits. People then started to exchange the certificates for goods and services, and the goldsmiths very quickly realized they could make a lot of money out of just looking after other people's valuable goods. The now no longer a goldsmith but running a deposit facility took in gold and other precious metals as deposit and issued deposit notes that the public used as money, backed by the gold in the deposit facility's safe. The goldsmith soon realized that very few people actually redeemed the gold, and so he started to give out loans in the form of deposit notes, knowing that he only needed around 10% of actual gold in his safe, as that would cover even on a busy day, the amount of people exchanging certificates for gold. The deposit facility would then require the loan repaid plus interest. And this was the birth of modern banking. Through the years, money has been backed by, given a store of value, by the silver standard and gold standard. Meaning you could redeem the note for gold just like it says on this US note here, if you so required. On the 21st of September, 1931, the gold standard was abolished in the UK and on the 13th of August, 1971, in the United States. Since 1971, the majority of the planet now use fiat currency. Fiat currency is money backed by nothing and has no value. It only has value because it's decreed as such by the government and more importantly, we all believe it has value. The only entities that have the legal authority to create money are the treasury and the banks, and they create it out of nothing. Martin Wolf, the Financial Times chief economic commentator, said this. Only 3% of money is physical, and 97% is electronic. And this electronic money is completely controlled by the banks. To repeat again, the banks create money out of nothing, and then lend it to you and ask you to work using the most precious commodity on the planet, your human energy, to pay back the loan plus interest. Money is essentially a claim on human labor and can also be defined as debt. A debt is created for you to pay back. So why don't the banks just print money and get rich that way? Well, because they need you. They need you to create a promissory note in the form of an agreement. A promissory note is a species of money, and when you complete and sign the agreement, the document now has value, just like a banknote. So, at the heart of money lending is a massive fraud. You create the money with the authority of your signature and the creation of a promissory note that the banks then securitize, making them more money. Then the bank makes you believe you have borrowed the money and requires you to pay it back, plus interest. Please remember this when you get to the section about debt later on in this documentary. During this documentary, you will hear people talk about promissory notes and bills of exchange. A promissory note is a promise to pay and is created by you, the debtor. And a bill of exchange is an order to pay and is created by the creditor. And they both have value. The way I try and explain the whole crux of the financial system is what I normally do when I'm doing a talk. I have a little bag of marbles and I have 10 marbles in there if I haven't lost one of them. And so what I do, I sort of get the marbles out, show everyone, right, 10 marbles, put them back in the bag. I say, right, is there anyone here that can get 11 marbles out of this bag? And they're all looking at me like I'm mad. I say, well, that's how the banking system works. It's absolutely crazy because what they do, they create a certain amount of money, but then they want more back. But hang on, that interest that they want more back doesn't exist. It can never exist. So two things have to happen as a result. 
one thing, the supply of money, or marbles, whatever we're talking about, has to increase. And not only does it increase, it has to increase exponentially, more on top and more. So it's basically the curve is going up and up and up and up. The other thing that happens is people are always, it's like musical chairs. You know, if we all stand up and dance and then we all sit down, but a chair is taken away, somebody is going to end up on the floor. Somebody can't find that money to pay back the, because that, that money does not, in, you know, does not exist. And this creates the poverty and crazy competition and not enough to go around. And this is the whole, the biggest problem with fractional reserve banking. Well, you think about it, they don't teach us at school anything about money. I mean, money's about the most important thing in this society. Why don't they teach us anything about it? They can't, don't they? They can't. It's a, it's, it's a confidence trick. Yeah. yeah? You know? And it's, it's, it's 180 degrees from way, the way we think of it. Uh, you know, we think that money comes from somebody else, but it actually comes from us. Yeah. You know, when you, when you get a, a loan, when you get a loan, they present you with a loan agreement. Yeah? What do you think that loan agreement is? It's a promissory note. Yeah. I promise to pay back three times the amount if it's a mortgage, you know? Yeah. You know? So that what they do, that promissory note, they monetize it. They put it into an account and cash it. And now they give you that money and say, now you have to pay it back to us. But you created that money. You know, it's your promissory note. You created that money. So transaction's over with. You don't have to pay them back because they didn't do anything. They just, they just went, um, thank you very much, and here you go. <laughs> Fundamentally, a promissory note is a promise, a promise to pay. Now, if I was going to give you a promissory note for two dozen eggs, that means here's uh, an IOU, the IOU, uh, you know, two dozen eggs. Now, it could be on demand or it could be at a, a set time in the future. If it was on demand, you would be within your right to say, John, look, anyway, right, here's a promissory note. It says on demand, I want two dozen eggs. So I said, all right, look, I haven't got on me on me. I'll, no, I'll pop over the shop and get you your eggs. Here we go. There we go. And this is what we did originally when promissory notes started out, uh, was that we used them to make a promise that, uh, because, you know, I, I've got like all these pounds of gold, right? And I want them stored safely and I want to be able to trade that gold but without the hassle of carrying it around. So what I do, I go to the bank and they give us a promissory note. So I've got this promise to pay. So I can then take it somewhere else and say, look, I've got two pounds of, you know, two pounds of gold here or silver, whatever it is. This is how it started out. Now, at no time have promissory notes been you know, outlawed or taken away. And this is how big corporations actually trade with each other with promissory notes. And in their memorandum or oh, articles of association, when they set up their businesses, a lot of them will state within their documents that they will take promissory notes. Now, the problem is, of course, that the actual Bank of England and our government working with the banks have taken away all the value to the promissory notes which are used as our, our currency. So now the promise to pay one pound, well, one pound of what? It's, it's not one pound of anything. It's just, uh, it's now become like monopoly money. This is back to the analogy with monopoly. It's not worth anything. So basically it's just a piece of paper. So what we do, we can actually say, well, here's a promissory note for a thousand pounds. I want to swap it for your promissory notes or put it into my bank account and uh, accredit my bank account with a thousand pounds. Now we spoke to a bank manager and we said to the bank manager, could you tell me what would happen if I came to your branch with a promissory note for a thousand pounds, would you have to accept it? And his words were, yes, of course I would. It's law. So you're going to accept a promissory note? Of course. No, I'm not going to accept it, but by law, I have to. So this is a bank manager that knew the law. He also knew the difference between a bill of exchange and a promissory note as well. So he was well up on his law. So, you know, and they, remember these are statutes, but because they, these, these are companies, they have to apply by their statutes, you see. We don't, but they do. So it's almost like, you know, they create enough 
rope and they are hanging themselves, you see. So that's the, it's actually, the statue is the way that we actually overcome them, I believe. But, yeah. Because this is evolving, so, you know, as, as we do things, they do things to counter and so on. But um, this is evolving. The, the latest one is, um, is, along with the remittance slip, um, other people have, have, uh, have created a promissory note which is literally a, a piece of paper that says, I promise to pay the bearer the, um, the sum of blah, blah, blah. And you sign it, date it, and now that becomes a specie of money according to the Bill of Exchange Act. Um, in fact, the, the money in your pocket is a promissory note. Somewhere it says, I promise to pay the bearer, and there's somebody's signature on it. Um, and it's actually a, 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 an invalid promissory note because it's not dated. Um, um, or actually, that's wrong. <laughs> that's actually wrong. Um, it's on demand, so it is dated. It's not actually getting away with stuff. This is the thing you've got to get. Um, you've got to get out of your head because what, what's really happening is they're getting away with it. Yeah, no, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. You're just um, yeah. you're just coming back into your power yeah. and and saying no. I'm not going to be. I'm not going to give away my signature anymore. This is what you're doing. Your signature is the most powerful thing on this planet, yeah? Um, your signature is worth an unlimited amount. And this is the thing we don't realise. We have the power. You can go into a bank, okay, and come away with £100,000 uh, as a loan, yeah? What do they take from you for that £100,000? Your signature. Your signature. Just your signature. You see the power of that signature now. Yeah. So with your signature, if you write your promissory note, you've created money. And that money is your promise to pay. Your promise to work, use your energy. Yeah. That's all there is. Your unlimited energy. And that is what the money is. And you supply it, not banks. Am I free to go? Listen, mate, I'm asking the questions. You're the public servant. Will you take your hand off my car, please? Thank you. I do not consent, officer. I don't consent to a medical He doesn't promise. consent in the police. But I am sovereign over my human body, and I do not consent to any search. I do not consent to any authority you feel you have over me. I am a sovereign British citizen, and I do not wish to be searched. I am the clinical pilot. Excuse me, it's our right to film you. It's our right to film you. Yes, it is. Under what law are we not allowed to film you? Because I'm asking you not to film you. That, you, you, you yeah, but you, you have no authority to tell me not to film Because we're in a public area. I'm James Parisi with the Quincy Police Department. What is your name, sir? That's good to know, sir. Yeah, what is your name? Well. I don't think that uh, by law I have to uh, identify myself if I'm on the sidewalk minding my own business and there's no laws being broken. You said, look, mate, I, don't, I can't give you the full section. I can't give you the full section because you can't expect me to know it is your words. Yeah? And I'm saying, well, if, you can't, if I can't expect you to know it, you can't expect me to know it. Can you show us the bottom, please? We've got a warrant for the arrest. Can you show us the bottom, please? I'm not happy with this bit, honestly. Okay, all right, well, am I being detained right now? No, you're being detained right now. I'm free to go. Sorry? I'm free to go. Not the moment, no, because I need to well, go. Well, am, am I being detained or arrested right now? The difference between lawful and legal, as I see, is um, lawful relates to common law, the law of the land, the law which um, governs all people, uh, the original law, um, which is quite straightforward. Um, it's a, to me, it's a case of um, don't cause any harm or loss or damage to any person and don't cause that to, be, to, to happen to anybody and everything's good. And you know, that's pretty straightforward and simple. Everyone can understand what that means. 
legal um, pertains to um, our legal system and where statutes and acts come from and it's a system that doesn't actually relate to common law so we've got these two systems running side by side we've been fooled into believing that they are one in the same and so when police are police in the streets um, we're enforcing policies uh, acts and statutes which when looked into are not actually necessarily lawful common law is the law of the land and laid down over centuries of court cases in front of juries humans making law for humans for the severest measure of punishment common law pertains to lawful and anything outside of lawful falls under the legal or no system at all the legal system covers all statutes and acts and civil matters things like owing money to banks not paying fines or tax basically anything that isn't criminal for there to be a crime there has to be an injured party in this case a human and there are three basic principles that all law needs to apply to they are as follows do not breach the peace cause no one else any harm cause no one else any loss do not use mischief in your promises and agreements Apart from that, everything else is free reign. Lawful uh, refers to the natural law, the law of the land, okay? And that's not causing any harm to anyone, um, obviously not stealing from anyone, and not using fraud in your contracts. So basically, you're not doing any harm or trying to get one over on anyone else. Uh, legal refers to the statutes, uh, which I you know, mentioned earlier and the statutes are basically all the rules of society and not just, you know, we haven't just got the UK statutes but we've got all the European statutes. So you've literally got uh, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of laws which every day, you know, we could be breaking without knowing. We all know that you can't go around raping and killing and murdering and invading. We don't need fucking laws for that, like we'll deal with that as it comes. but. Anything other than that, what you want to smoke, where you want to live, where you want to take a shit, who you want to insult, not a fucking other adult on this planet. Like, what are you, my dad? Are you my fucking dad telling me what to do? Like, that's how I feel now when police or like, you know, control freaks try and give it to me. Legal is, is essentially um, according to contract. You have to, the, the rules that are, um, are sort of handed down to us, um, but you have to contract with them before uh, they, they become law. Um, so, the, and that law is, is, is contract law. You know, you, you enter into contract, you're bound by it. Um, so, so, yeah, it's, it's it, two different things. One's overlaid on top of the other. Parliament has no say in common law and is bound by it. So they create acts of parliament and in the US, acts of Congress. Because government is a creation of man, and a creation of man can never be above man, they need your consent before they have the force of law. The principle of by consent, if people don't realise, is that we, are, we obviously have police because we want them, and that we only have to do what they say if it's reasonable, if we consent to what they're asking to. That is the principle of it for me. Obviously, the larger, the larger issue is the assumption that everybody who's walking on this land has given consent to be policed by these people. And that's an assumption that most police officers in this country live by without realising that it's, it's not true. You know? And this is where diplomatic immunity is a good example of where, well, actually the consent isn't given and the police don't have the power to act. Another good example that shows it's all about jurisdiction is that our police have no power at all at the American Embassy. But that's on our land, isn't it? And this is, that's another example. Embassies are a good example that shows that jurisdiction is portable. It's not tied to land, it's tied to the party. So I can carry my jurisdiction with me, which is the whole principle of, of sovereignty in general. My understanding of policing by consent is that, um, as I said earlier, when a law is, is passed, 
um, for it to be lawful, it has to have the consent of the people. People have to consent to that law and consent to abide by it. Um, but unfortunately, I think we're in a system now where uh, that obviously doesn't happen, but people don't realise that by um, verbally agreeing with, let's say, a police officer in, in, in um, relating to a parking ticket, um, that you're entering into a verbal contract and you're, by agreeing with what the officer is saying, you're, you're consenting to, um, to being bound by the law, or whatever the law is. And um, people, when, when we say words like, do you understand, when a police officer says to you, reads the caution and says, do you understand, um, what they're actually saying is, do you stand under our authority? Now again, you know, I didn't know this as a police officer and even the words that are spoken as a police officer, um, police don't even necessarily understand themselves. So I believe that people have to consent to a law for it to apply to them um, in the legal sense um, because it's not common law. So when you interact with the police or the court system, they will ask you for your name, address and date of birth. This is done to create joinder between you and your legal fiction and to trick you into representing it. Once you agree to represent your legal fiction, now they can deal with you. They can only apply their legal mechanisms if they have the slave, the name of the slave they're dealing with. If you state, well, I don't want to give my name, then they can't apply the mechanisms to you because they have no name for their paperwork. And remember, all their systems work via paperwork. It's all paperwork. I think you might be wanted. Well, if I'm wanted, what's the problem? You'd be arrested. Well, then arrest me then, innit? Well, I need to establish who you are. No, you don't. If you think I'm the person that's wanted, arrest me, innit? Where do you live? Tell me your date of birth. What? What can you want? I want your details now. Me up for what? Give me your details. Me up for what? Give me your details. Well, get my details, and I tell you this as well. Yeah, I tell you this as well. I'm not a criminal. I'm a peaceful man killing out of here. I just burn down the system of corruption and pollution that we're not a But in the meantime, I'll leave you to it. But if, if there's any problems, then I have to come back and obtain your details and speak to you further. Look, look, okay? you have no right to just leave me to it. You have no right to say you're going to come back and ask for my details. I'm me. He's him. He's him. Yeah. You're you. That's our details. Oh yeah, yeah. Am I obliged to give you my details? I've spoken to you, okay? Yes. We've asked you to leave the store. Yes. Wait a second, wait a second. Can you have my details? I'm going, I'm, am I obliged to give you my details? You're not obliged to give me your details. Oh, great, okay. Why? How are you defining yourself under the sense of our definition? Am I obliged to answer that, sir? I did not wish to answer any questions, sir. I'm just asking you. Am I obliged? You're not no, obliged. I'm not obliged. I'm no comment. Asking. That's fine. What are you doing? Am I obliged to answer that, sir? No. No comment. Okay. Are you going to answer any of my questions? If I'm obliged, I will, but if I'm not obliged, then I won't be answering any questions. Alright, that's fine. Are you going to tell us your name or not? Am I obliged? And then you'll get out your van and come over and try to intimidate me. Go back to your van and go away. There'll be no complaints. Stay here. I'll be speaking to your sergeant about all of you. Right, right, so you're good. demanding now, are you? Or are you requesting that I give you my details? details. Right, well, I would politely decline right, your request. Why is that? What's your reason for the call? Privacy. You got a you got an ID or driver's license on or something? Yeah. Nope. Not gonna do it. What's your name and badge number? Officer Carlson, ID seven three four five. Okay. Let me entertain him. I'm free to go. Free to go whenever you want to. Thank you, sir. I'm asking you again, am I obliged to give you my details? I'd like to, because I'm going to do a name check. I got it, I got it. I'd like to see if, I got it. if you're we, banned from okay. this area or Okay, whatever. well I'm asking you again, I know you'd like to, but I'm, uh, the reason, just to explain to you, the reason I don't like to give my details is because I don't trust where those details go. Do you understand? You will know as well as I know, sir, that in order for you to ask me my name, you have to suspect me of committing a crime. You know and I know that you don't suspect me of committing a crime. You're just poking around where you don't belong. Okay, is there a problem, officer? Constable. Basically, under one, um, section 163, I'm allowed to check. Uh, of course you are. And I know I'm not obliged to give any details whatsoever. However, I'd like to know, is there a problem? I don't even have to speak to you unless you're going to arrest me, mate. That's, that's you got some mate. mental health problems? No, mate. No, I just, know my, I just know my right to remain silent. Well, 
No, I didn't. Yes, you did, mate. When the camera was not on. That's what Sir, you said. Have you okay? Got contact phone number? Right, no, I haven't got a contact phone number. That is, I'm not obliged to give any contact phone number. All I would like now is my card back. I've not accepted any paperwork from you guys, and I want to go on my way. I'm going to be detained right now. Legally, yeah? Legally, you're meant to confirm your name and address to me. Lawfully? Hold on. Lawfully? Lawfully? Yeah, lawfully. You're not. supposed to answer me. You're a public servant. But yet, what? No, you can't see my ID. Can I see your ID? I'm glad you brought that up. Can I see your ID? I see your... I think over the paper, you're going to have to give us your details, okay? I don't have to give you any details. You're going to have to. Call the sergeant, mate. I don't have to give you any details. Okay. With... No, ma'am, you may not. I am talking to you and investigating something now. I can't... You're investigating me for what crime? I didn't say it was a crime. Okay, then there's no probable cause or reasonable suspicion for me to, cross, for me to provide it. Why are you this out? Because... And then what would you do if I was to say that I don't have a name? Like, well, how, how would you look me up or anything like that? Well, we wouldn't. Because if I yeah. stop you like this yeah. to have a chat yeah. and I ask for your name, you don't have to tell me. Yeah, no. I'm you just glad you to. know that because a lot of police officers where I'm from don't actually know that. You don't have to Basically. give me a name. The only time you have to give me a name... you caught me breaking the law. Or, well no, even then you don't, because you can be booked yeah. in as on I suppose, yeah, I can replace The only time you're legally obliged to give your name, yeah. address and date of birth is yeah. when you drive in a car. If you haven't broken any laws, um, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to interact with the police if you don't want to. Um, if they come up and, and try and engage you in conversation, and you haven't done anything, then you don't have to engage in conversation with them. You can just, you're free to walk away. Um, uh, if, if they want to detain you, they need reasonable, uh, reasonable grounds for, to do that. Um, and if they don't have reasonable grounds to do that, then they're actually um, in, in breach of their oath. and They're, they're liable. With statutes and acts, um, the consent of the people, those are the people that are there to govern, has not been obtained. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's frowned upon, it's very much a grey area and um, police are being used to enforce statutes and acts um, of, the, of the legal system and are not really understanding what that means and, and what, it, what it means as a police officer to police. I believe that laws, uh, Black's Law Dictionary states that a statute is a legislative rule of a society given the force of law by those who consent. So a statute isn't, it doesn't actually say a statute is a law, it is, says it's a legislative rule of a society given the force of law, but only by those who consent to being in that society or consent to the fact that, uh, consent to the law. So if you say to a policeman when they stop you, I'm sorry, I do not consent, uh, I do not understand, that is, I do not stand under you, then you know you can step away from that. But it's important that you uphold the actual natural law. And of course the policemen uh, and magistrates and uh, also the Queen, they all uh, state oaths to the law of the land. So you can ask an officer if he's actually, are you on, on your oath? So it, it, it's important that uh, you know we can actually get them on their oath because they, they don't swear an oath to uphold the law of the sea or statutes. They swear an oath to uphold the law of the land. If you're pulled up by the police and the police say to you, can, it, can, you have, can I have your name? And you say no, which is officially you don't have to give your name. It's actually on the Metropolitan Police site itself. It actually says you don't have to answer their questions. Um, but if you don't answer their questions, they're going to do one of two things. If you get a good copper, they're going to go, OK, not a problem, you haven't really done anything wrong, we'll leave you alone. You get a bad copper, then you're going to get dragged to the floor, roughed about, cuffs on, you'll be dragged down the station, where you will be bullied and coerced into giving your name in the end. And if you don't, they will just keep you as long as they possibly can. To lock any human being in a room that they can't leave, and especially in a room that has the very, very bare essentials, is torture. So remember... If you haven't broken any laws, no one has the right to tell you what to do. We are all equal in the eyes of the law, from the Queen to the police and to you or I. And we are all innocent until proven guilty. So if a policeman stops you in the street and you haven't broken any laws, do not comply. Always ask, 
am I detained? Or, am I free to go? Do not give your details and ask if you're obliged to. If they do try to search you or arrest you without your consent, tell them you are doing this under duress. If you have not broken the law, do not comply. Only interact with the police if you wish to. If you do not wish to, do not consent. The more of us that do not comply, the less likely this country will become like Nazi Germany or communist China. The police swear an oath to the Queen, so ask them if they are under their oath. If they reply yes, they are bound by said oath and can only uphold common law. This is uh, certainly the most updated. Uh, when I joined it was slightly differently worded to this, but this is probably the most updated and it starts with I, you state your name, of, you state whichever police force you are serving, do solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that I will well and truly serve the Queen in the office of constable with fairness, integrity, diligence and impartiality, upholding fundamental human rights and according equal respect to all people and that I will, to the best of my power, cause the peace to be kept and preserved and prevent all offences against people and property and that while I continue to hold the said office, I will, to the best of my skill and knowledge, discharge all the duties thereof faithfully according to law. That is the oath and attestation of a police constable. If you ask a policeman to say, are you on your oath, uh, very often they change their, you know, they actually realise what you're talking about and they change their behaviour because their oath was to uphold the common law of the land and not the statutes, not the law of the sea, which is the law of commerce. Because we realise that everything now is to do with commerce. You know, with a policeman stop us, you know, you're not wearing a seatbelt. Well, who, who am I causing harm to? Where's the loss or damage? It's crazy. And so they say, oh no, you're breaking the law. Well, I'm just breaking a rule, but what, why? What authority do they have over us? I haven't given them my authority. The oath that every police officer is to, to preserve the property, life and subjects of, of the Queen. Now that to me is people, property, disturbances, breach of the peace. That's how I understand the, the Office of Constable to be now. It's basically an oath is a promise. I promise to enforce the law, I promise to, to serve Her Majesty's subjects, I promise to prevent them as, as much as I can, prevent them from being harmed, to prevent their property from being destroyed. That to me is the oath of a constable. Please take an oath when they join the service. Um, again, they don't really understand what that means. It's not explained in any details. It's kind of a grey area. You just take it to mean whatever you want it to mean. But it's all been set up to allow um, the system that currently enslaves people to carry on enslaving and to further that enslavement into every aspect of our lives. Hey guys, so I'm here at Parliament Square for the Occupy London protest. Um, I've just come over to a group of police officers who are protecting and serving the people today. Um, I've just approached this guy here who obviously has his back to me now. What's your name please sir? Obviously you're obliged to tell me it's your job as a public servant to identify yourself. So could I have your name please? Okay we have here Constable Bird. It's a pleasure to meet you, sir. I have here about 200 copies of the UK Police Officers' Oath of Office. I've just asked them to, if they know their oath. They've gone very quiet on me. This isn't atta an attack on you guys, just so you know. Like, I'm not trying to cause trouble with you or anything. I'm just trying to make sure you do your job properly, obviously. I mean, some emergencies just come up, so I'm going to follow them just to see why they're avoiding my questions. I think we all know it's because they don't know their oath. But I'd like to offer them a copy just to see if they will remember why they became police officers, which was obviously to protect and serve the people of this country. But if during their programming and their training and stuff have forgotten who they actually went into the job for, I'd like to remind them. So I still have the oath in my hand. Look, you can see all the copies. Um, they're walking away from me. They don't want to hear it. My aim 
at this protest is obviously to help the police remember their oath, to remember what it is that gives them this authority in the first place, and hopefully they will honour humanity and uphold... Let me just read their oath to you guys. Look, they're really walking away from the square and everything. They don't want to hear this at all. I, so-and-so of wherever, do solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that I will well and truly serve the Queen in the office of constable with fairness, integrity and diligence and impartiality upholding fundamental human rights and according equal respect to all people and that I will to the best of my power cause the peace to be kept and preserved and prevent all offences against How people and property. The traffic, madam. The yeah. traffic, sorry. And sorry, where was I? Prevent all offences against people and property. And that while I continue to hold the said office, I will, to the best of my skill and knowledge, discharge all yes, the duties thereof faithfully according to law. So could you now recite that back to me? <laughs> <laughs> this is going on the internet, by the way. <laughs> Not even an acknowledgement from them, guys. This is what we're dealing with. They've just completely ignored all attempts and walked off to their van and gone away. <laughs> what are we supposed to do? I'm not giving up. I've got about 200 copies of their oath of office. That I'm going to give out to them and I'm going to ask them to uphold it and say, will you honour this oath and remember why you started this job? And hopefully, fingers crossed, some of them remember that it's the people that they work for. So wish, wish us luck, guys, because we're on a mission to convert these guys to truth and love. Wish us luck. Namaste. Excuse me, vehicle. take your hands out my camera. So I've seen many, many sorts of videos on YouTube and the like recently uh, where people have been filming encounters with police officers and they've basically been told that they, they can't film. But if you look at the Metropolitan Police's official website, it actually states that you can film police officers if it's in a public domain. If it's in a private domain, then obviously that, that may well be different because there's certain, certain laws of, of corporations and whatever that, that may prevent that. But certainly if, if you, you take a, a camera or a phone and you record the encounter, there's nothing illegal about that at all. It's, it may be help as a witness, to, as, a, as an accurate account of what's being said, so there's sort of no uh, ambiguity at a later stage but certainly not illegal to film anyone in a public domain. There are simply no laws preventing you from filming in public. This also includes the filming of the police performing their duties. Here is a letter that was sent in 2010 to all police stations regarding filming in public. Dear colleagues, guidance for photographers. I am writing to you in my capacity as chair of the ACPO, Communications Advisory Group, which sits in the presidential business area. There have been a number of instances highlighted in the press where officers have detained and deleted images from their cameras. I seek your support in reminding your officers and staff that they should not prevent anyone from taking photographs in public. This applies equally to members of the media and public seeking to record images who do not need a permit to photograph or film in public places. ACPO guidance is as follows. There are no powers prohibiting the taking of photographs, film or digital images in public places. Therefore, members of the public and press should not be prevented from doing so. We need the cooperation with the media and amateur photographers. They play a vital role as their images help us identify crime. 
we must acknowledge that citizen journalism is a feature of modern life and police officers are now photographed and filmed more than ever. Unnecessarily restricting photography, whether for the casual tourist or professional, is unacceptable and it undermines public confidence in the police service. Once an image has been recorded, the police have no power to delete or confiscate it without a court order. Yours sincerely, Andrew Trotter, Chief Constable, Chair of ACPO Communications Advisory Group. As a professional television cameraman or a member of the public, I am allowed to stand in the street and shoot. I don't need four police officers or wardens or whatever you are when I stop to do this. This is absolutely bloody ridiculous. And I'm fed up with every single time that I do this of being stopped and being questioned and being treated like some kind of criminal. Oh, for God's sake, this is Windsor Castle. There are a million people around here with cameras. Do you think a terrorist would stand here with a tripod and make it bloody obvious? Or do you think a tripod would just get a home video, a, a terrorist would get a home video camera out and shoot? It's obviously, I'm working my time you, you clearly are. Thank you very much. Let me get on with my day. I'm not arguing. I'm asking you a question. Can I film anything in public? In the in the public? If it's against the law to film in public, then everybody with a camera would be breaking the law, wouldn't they? What is the actual law saying? I'm not allowed to film you. Nothing. There is okay, no law so, saying you can't. Okay. Okay. There is only one act that gives police blanket powers to search the public, and this is Section 60 of the Criminal, Justice and Public Order Act 1994. But this needs to be authorized by an inspector or above, and only if he or she suspects that instances involving serious violence may take place and that persons are carrying dangerous instruments or offensive weapons. The order will cover a specific area, normally a town or suburb, for a period of no longer than 24 hours. In a nutshell, if there has been a riot or a gang fight or something of that nature, a Section 60 may be brought into force and anyone in that area can be searched without reasonable grounds for suspicion. All other bases for searches need reasonable grounds for suspicion and they must follow Go Wisely. Officers conducting a stop and search will work through a process called Go Wisely. If officers do not follow Go Wisely, they leave themselves open to an assault allegation and the search itself being unlawful. The police currently have over 20 stop and search powers. They are mainly for weapons, drugs, stolen property or articles intended to damage property. Those made using powers from Section 1 of the Police and Criminal Evidence Act, commonly referred to as PACE searches, are the most common. Go Wisely is a mnemonic that was created so the police could easily remember the terms laid down in Section 1 of PACE. Section 1 of PACE is the foundation document for all searches that require reasonable grounds for suspicion. In this modern age, it is very easy to download the documents from the website supplied, such as Section 1 of PACE, a breakdown of Go Wisely, etc and keep them on your mobile phone, so if you do ever have an encounter with the police, you have evidence straight away to show them that you know what they require to make the encounter legal. If a police officer insists on searching you, do not resist. It will only end one way. Tell the officer that you are alarmed and distressed and you are being searched under duress and make it very clear that you do not agree with the search and only sign the paperwork if you want to. Signing the paperwork means you agree to being searched. 
Take a lesson from the previous section and always film your encounters with the police. This tactic works twofold. Normally, when you pull a camera out, the police completely change their attitude and work to a more professional standard. Secondly, you have evidence of the entire encounter in case the police officer tries to make any false allegations against you. If you are being searched under the Misuse of Drugs Act 1971, the police officer must comply to go wisely as laid out in PACE Section 1. The root power for the search comes from PACE Section 1 and they must adhere to it. If the police do not follow PACE Section 1, then the search can be considered unlawful and an assault charge can be filed against the officer or officers as with R. v. Bristol, 2007, where the police refused to give their name and the station they were dispatched from. From the mnemonic, go wisely, the most important aspects for you to question are grounds, object, and lawful reason. Ask the officer what are the grounds for the search and the object of the search, what he thinks he will find, and what laws allow him to do this. This is important because the police have to justify why they have stopped you and record this. And asking the questions makes it harder for them to stop you without reason. The point to all this information is, the police cannot search you unless a section 60 is in place without reasonable suspicion. You can, in such cases as a drug search, refuse by not giving consent as laid out in the Drugs Act 2005. Here is an example of how this information can help you and possibly make the police treat you with a little more due diligence. No, it's not. As you both can be searched for Section 23. Misuse of drugs. I, I do right. not consent to the search. You don't get a choice, my friend. What do you mean I don't get, I don't get, wait, hold on. I don't consent to the search and you just told me I don't get a choice, yeah? You wait, you're telling me I don't get a choice, yeah? Wait, wait, wait. Because you're a public servant. I'm going to let you search me after you answer my questions. You're telling me I don't have a choice, yeah? That's what you're saying. I don't have a choice, yeah? What I'm saying to you is, is I don't have a choice. Listen. I no, no, no. You're a public servant. I'm allowed to record you. And, and plus, you, do you know what? You can take my phone and smash it. This is live streaming. You can take the phone, it's live streaming, it's save straight into my laptop. So you can try to confiscate it all you like. I've got you on camera. You just said I don't have a choice. Don't touch my phone, that's assault. You just touch my hand. That's if I did that to you, I'll get nicked for assault. Don't do it to me. Well, I'm not here for nicking people for assault. Yeah, well, don't do it to me. Okay. What I can say, then you see that as everything. You can't. No, you can't. It doesn't matter because I still got it on my laptop. It's, it's a live stream. Go and what, what are you searching me for? What's, what, what, what are you searching me for? You come out that bin. Yeah, his hands gone down. He drops it behind the bin button. All right. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. You. Okay, right. which gives me the reason to believe the fact you're down an alleyway for no real reason. The I just told you, yeah. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. We're going to walk up to that bin, yeah. Okay? And if I see anything down there, yeah, right, I'm going to turn a pair of you over. If All I right, don't, cool. then we're good, yeah. Walk up, then. You walk up. I'm going to walk, walk up to you, my friend. You're a public servant, and you're not, you're not following your duties properly. Listen, my duties. Okay. Your duties are to up, up, uphold the law of the land, and that's it. Nothing else. Nothing else. You're not obliged to tell them, but we don't have to tell them. And I'm telling him the law, in it, just in case he doesn't know. He doesn't have to tell you. No. I will not calm down. You don't have to tell them your name, Phil. If you want to, you can, but if you, if you don't... Yeah? You never found nothing. You're not going to search me. That was your deal, is it? Yeah, that's my deal. Cool. And now I need to ask you a question. Are you working in accordance to the oath that you took to become a police officer? I need to answer that question. Of course you do. You're a public service. You're a public servant. You have to answer all questions. <laughs> <laughs> but how, how do you feel about being searched for knocking on the door? I feel like an animal. I yeah. feel like I'm being thrown against a wall and told to enter my pockets. Yeah. This is like a legit gang. How often do you get stopped and searched? Every day. Every day? Every day.
if you were being stopped by the police under Section 163 of the Road Traffic Act, which allows the police to stop a person driving a mechanically propelled vehicle. You could argue that you are not a person and that you're not driving, you are just travelling, which would all be true but will probably get you nowhere. They will then most probably move on to Section 164, which grants them the power to ask for your driver's licence so they can confirm your details and that you're legally allowed to drive the car. Now, since this is an act we are talking about, there is no law saying that you must give your name. But by having a driver's license, registering your car and paying road tax, you sort of agree to it through conduct. To the rules of the Road Traffic Act, that is. The best advice here is to stay in your car and roll your window down, just enough so you can hear the officer and they can hear you. The police have no right to ask you to step out of your vehicle. Ask them why they have stopped you. If they reply Section 163, Section 164 or Section 165 of the Road Traffic Act, it is just to check documents. So give them your license or give them your details. If they require any further details, for example, your insurance documents, ask them for a producer. This is laid out in Section 165 and allows you seven days to produce documents at a police station of your choice. This could also be the key to not having your car towed if the police cannot confirm you have insurance. It is clearly laid out in Section 165 that you have seven days to produce your documents before it becomes an offence. The police have no right to grab your keys out of your vehicle. If they are stopping you under Section 163, 164 or 165 of the Road Traffic Act, if you wish, respectively decline to answer any other questions. Officers have to be in uniform to enforce the Road Traffic Act as it is a statute. Plain clothes officers cannot use Section 163, Section 164 or Section 165 of the Road Traffic Act or enforce any statutes or acts that do not contain a criminal element. Through extensive research, the makers of this documentary now believe that the majority of pace, stop and searches and stops under the Road Traffic Act, Section 163, are for intelligence gathering purposes. And this is why they are on the increase and officers are not trained or forced to remember the wording of individual acts as it would contradict with what they are doing. A new trend is occurring with police searches and it has to do with the taking of mobile phones to check the IMEI numbers. You're right, Sarge. How are you doing? You okay? I'm fine, thank you. Is it, you don't want to give the officers your details? Yeah. What, is there a reason for that? Because I haven't committed any crime or I don't think I'm obliged to. No, you don't. You don't have to. Yeah. Um, what we will do is we do an IMEI check on your phone, though. We are being told to do that. What's that? Okay? Check your phone to make sure it belongs to you. Okay? It belongs to me. It was given by yeah, my girlfriend. Yeah, we're, we're entitled to do that, okay? Okay. So if you could hand your phone over to the officers and we'll do a check on that. Okay. You have to do that. Sorry? Do I, am I obliged to give you my phone? Yeah, yeah you are. Alright. We're checking to make sure it's I've got that on record. Now everyone has a mobile phone, and I would think it very difficult for them to say they had reasonable grounds to suspect that the phone was stolen unless the officer's information was intelligence-based. After an extensive search online, nothing came up, so I called the police to ask them. Here is that conversation. Can I help you? Yeah, hi, mate. Um, I don't know if I've come through to the right number or not, but I just got a, a really quick question about um, police procedures. Um, yeah, a friend of mine a couple of weeks ago was stopped in the street. It wasn't in Hertfordshire, it was in London. Um, but he was, um, uh, when he was stopped, they took his mobile phone off him and said they were doing an IMEI check. What is the legality behind that? Because I couldn't see anything online on the website or on the police website or what act it is or what powers they're using to do that. 
Um, there's no particular powers required to do that. If they, if they believe yeah. um, that it could be a stolen phone or they're checking the legality of the phone to check that it isn't stolen, then we have a link with the monitoring company that provides the EMEI numbers. Oh, okay. So there's nothing I could... There's nothing I could find online that actually says this is a part of a pace or part of an act or anything like that. It's just quite legit. No, 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 no. no. This is this, this is the old fashioned sort. Of, the old terms would be stuff and deal. You know. Yeah. If they think that if they've got a reason to believe. Yeah. Then yeah, they're they're in their full rights to check the IMB or number. If there's no problems, return it. If it's stolen, then yeah, deal with it. Okay. Uh, can someone refuse, or is it or is it mandatory? Um. Yeah, you can refuse. If they've got reasonable cause to believe, yeah, um, then they can take, you know, take the phone and the person to the police station for further inquiries. As you can hear from the conversation, the police need reasonable grounds for suspicion. That means they must suspect that your phone has been stolen before they can take it and perform an IMEI number check. This seems to be a new police tactic to try and gain your details through underhanded and mischievous means. A breach of the peace is an old common law concept which is used to prevent unlawful violence against people or property. A breach of the peace is not a criminal offence in itself. However, special powers exist for the purpose of stopping or preventing anyone from breaching or threatening a breach of the peace by committing unlawful violence. A breach of the peace are actions which harm another person or harm his property in his presence, are actions that are likely to provoke such harm. A breach of the peace may occur on public or private property. There is no criminal offence for breach of the peace for which someone can be prosecuted. The power exists to prevent a breach of the peace. An arrest can be made but only to remove someone from the situation or if an imminent breach is reasonably anticipated. This means that if you are arrested for a breach of the peace or to prevent a breach of the peace, you cannot be charged or prosecuted as it is a professional power. A breach of the peace is covered more extensively later in this documentary in the section regarding bailiffs. Section 5 is probably one of the most abused powers the police have in their arsenal and a police officer can arrest without warrant if he believes you are in breach of this section. Since February 2014, the word insulting has been removed from the Act to move into line with Article 10 of the Human Rights Act. This means you can say whatever you wish as long as it's not aggressive in nature or provoking violence. The best advice is to stay calm and not swear or make threats and as long as you have not broken the law, harm, injury or loss to a fellow human, you will be fine. Just remember this, most police officers respect being respected and you will have a greater chance of moving on with your day if you do so. But always stand up for your rights. These are the most common types of police interactions, but there are many more acts they could use to try and stop you in your everyday life. Just remember that it is all online and you have the right to check if you doubt what the police officer is telling you. What you are watching here are the police violently arresting protesters for small infractions such as not listening to a police command, not giving details, or Section 5 public disorder. They have committed no crime and are now essentially being tortured. The police seem to be able to get away with horrendous acts towards people and in some cases treat the general public worse than criminals. For example, imagine someone is arrested for assault, then taken back to a police station and refuse to give his name. Would the police then throw him to the ground and assault him until he gives his name? 
The answer in most cases is a resounding no. That would be torture. Article 3 of the Human Rights Act that was incorporated into English law in 1998 states, No one shall be subject to torture or inhumane or degrading treatment or punishment. Another case similar to this would be smashing someone's window to enforce the Road Traffic Act, essentially breaking a law to enforce an act, a rule. The police need to go back to policing, preventing a breach of the peace and protecting people and property. Upholding rules should never be done by force. You are a sovereign entity and no one has the right to tell you what you should or shouldn't do or how you conduct your life if you haven't broken any laws. If someone had that power over you, then you would be a slave. Think about it. As covered in the first part of this documentary, money does not exist. It is a figment of our imaginations and is backed by nothing. When you borrow money from a bank, they don't take it from their vault and give it to you. Instead, you fill out an agreement, sign it, and they tap on their computers and hey presto, the money is brought into existence. For a contract to be legal, it must have equal worth. The bank basically give you nothing and expect you, using your own human labor, which is the most valuable commodity on the planet, to work to pay it back. This alone renders the contract void. Debt and the whole industry associated with it is central to the control system that surrounds you. Possibly the only times that you feel intimidated in your life is for police encounters for non-criminal activities and when you owe money to a creditor and then consequently the debt collectors or bailiffs they send after you. How, in 2015, do we still have scenes like this? Contracts and debt can never be remedied by force. We will show you that debt collectors and bailiffs have no powers except in very extreme circumstances and only as a last resort, meaning everything you're watching here is completely unlawful. Even when force is authorized, it is classified as reasonable force and cannot be used against a human. Owing money is not a crime and you can never go to prison for not paying a debt. The whole of the debt industry runs on fear and ignorance. So now when debt collectors call, the first thing, well, not that they call me anymore, but if they did call me, I think now the first thing I would do is say, thank you very much for paying off my debt. That's really kind of you. <laughs> you know? And they say, what do you mean? I said, well, you bought my debt. You might have only paid 10p in the pound for it. But as far as I'm concerned, you've paid off my bank account. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. <laughs> so, yeah, and the great thing is you can have a laugh with them, uh, you know, because you don't take it. You know, what happened when they first started calling me, I used to get really nervous and my voice would start going all wavy and, you know, my heart would start going and I'd be on the phone to them because I felt really guilty because I felt I'd something, done something terribly wrong 
getting into debt, you know. And I, then I realised that the whole system is designed to get us into debt and designed to, the, the fact is the debts can't be paid off. And every single politician that comes on the television and says, oh, we've got to make cuts and, you know, we've got to do this and they're trying to cut our little local hospital down here in Swanage. Well, the fact is that it doesn't matter how many cuts we make, we can never pay off the national debt or we, can, we can't even keep up with the interest on it because it's growing exponentially. And so this is all part of this control mechanism to keep us poor, to keep not enough to go around, when in fact, you know, if it wasn't for the money, we would have complete abundance. Um, with debt collectors, um, people assume when a debt collector comes round that uh, they have actual power to, to uh, um, do something to you anything to you. They don't. They have no power whatsoever. Um, they only have the power that you give to them. Um, they, they, they're kind of like third party, you know, strangers, interlopers, you know, they've, they've, they're kind of interfering in your, in your financial affairs. You know, you didn't, you didn't contract with them. You know, you don't know who they are. They've just turned up on your doorstep um, demanding money. You know, who are they? You know, um, so what they do is they, they bully you or trick you into contracting with them. And if you contract with them, now you've got a contract with them, they can, they can chase you for money and hound you for money. They have a, they'll have a legal right to, to come after you. But that, they, they have nothing until you give them that. And one of the tricks they do um, is they might say, um, yeah, give us, give us one pound a, a week or one pound a month. Yeah, just, just give us one pound a month. Uh, you know, that sounds kind, kind of reasonable, you know, especially if you, if you really genuinely believe that you have a debt to pay, yeah. Um, yeah, it sounds quite reasonable. But as soon as you start paying them one pound a month, you've just said that you owe them something. So you've contracted it with them. So now that you have to pay them the amount, and that's what usually happens, they'll come after you for the full amount, because now they have the, uh, the authority that you've given them to, to, to chase that amount. I've got very little time for debt collectors. I think I've called them everything from the uh, detritus of the human psyche to uh, the scarred baton bearers of old that would wait around the corner waiting to pounce on the, on the innocent and the unwary and those unable to defend themselves. Because the funny thing about debt collectors is, as soon as you show you know what they're talking about, they disappear. So uh, they are actually only there to bully money from those who don't know how to take a stand or don't know what their rights are. Uh, yeah, a very low opinion of debt collectors. To the people who are worried about debt, let me quote a friend of mine who I will call Jay. Uh, because I'm not going to name him because he still works for the Royal Bank of Scotland. He's a credit risk underwriter for Royal Bank of Scotland, quite high up. And on the trading floor and all the kind of, you know, kind of stuff he does, they have a saying, the only person that owns a debt is the person who worries about it. And it's as simple as that. Don't worry about your debt. It's not real. Okay, it's real in the extent you, you fucking agreed, but it's not. No one's going to die, nothing bad's going to happen, no one's going to get thrown in debtor's prison because it doesn't exist anymore. The reason why Western capitalism is crumbling is because people are starting to be wise to the fact that it's a big bullshit circus charade run by those in charge to make sure that they stay rich. And it's common knowledge in the BBC, Guardian, New York Times that in the last five years of recession, the rich have become fucking much richer and the poor have become poorer. If that's not enough cause for revolution, I don't know what is, but people, the only thing that holds people back with anything is fear. My advice to deal with debt collectors or to deal with anybody else is get informed. If you understand what you're talking about, you have a much more powerful position than if you don't know. If you don't know what you're talking about, you are at the mercy of people who pretend to know what they're talking about. My advice is get informed, understand your rights, understand their rights, what they can do and what they can't do and then you're in a much better position to defend off any, any illegality or, or, or anything that, that, that goes against what should be done. Since the financial decline starting around 2007 to present, caused by the banks and then subsequently bailed out by public money, the effects of which are still being felt across the world. Since 2007, 
suicide rates in males between 35 and 55 have skyrocketed and can be directly related to debt. Oh, right, yeah. right, right. So you had to go to another eviction in Allingwood and the bloke had hung himself? Oh, my God. Oh, no. Oh, it's not good, is it? Really? Isn't it? It's not Seriously. Good. Our heart goes out to Bloody everybody. Hell. everybody. Awesome. Right, well, I'll just make oh, this question. Oh, this is what's going on. Have you finished the book today? Also, suicide rates in postgraduate students has risen drastically and can be directly attributed to debt. Before we continue, you must realize that no one has power over you. The system that surrounds you is just an illusion created by the mind of man. Owing money or breaching a contract can never be remedied by force. And in this game of cat and mouse, knowledge is your most powerful weapon. Fill this week. I'm not stopping you. Right. So is the water? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Take it back. Where's he going? What is he doing? Stop that. You're being really stupid. Why don't you get some respect yourself? Have a bit of dignity. We've got a warrant for arrest. Can you show us the warrant, please? Show us your documentation. Show us the warrant, please. With a wet signature. Yes, uh, as a human being to another human being, my dear, I'm just wondering, I just wonder what would motivate people to work for debt collection agencies. Because all you do is hassle two people. So you can't get, so you've not got the original cre credit agreement with a wet ink on it, so you've got no proof of claim. Have you got the deed of assignment, mate? Well, the reason is, all the other get debt companies before you tried to get some money out of me and didn't manage it. I'm just wondering what makes you think that I'm going to pay you anything. So what the council's done is handed it on to a different set of private bailiff called Marston High Court Enforcement Officers and Certified Bailiffs. Right, I'll, I'll, I'll just tell you something now, right? Council tax, yeah? You cannot force them to go somebody else. Yeah? I hope you enjoyed wasting your time. Yeah, See, ya. Well, See you later. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> My name is John Witterick uh, and I have a website called getoutofdebtfree.org and uh, basically what we do, we help people uh, realise that the whole banking system is basically fraudulent and we offer them the tools to actually challenge a banking system and basically get themselves out of this fictitious debt. The services we offer are, uh, we offer template letters. We also offer little, I mean start off with if you're working with debt collectors, if you're dealing with debt collectors, uh, we've actually got a very simple way of dealing with them which is uh, basically a you know, addressee not recognised return to sender uh, because uh, it will always have your name either in uh, uppercase letters or it will have a title called Mr or Mrs and you can say well hang on that's not me I'm not the title I don't spell my name in uppercase letters so the addressee is not recognised so that's one way. Uh, the other way we deal with uh, uh, the bank banking system or debt collectors is basically say well where did the money come from uh, and have I got a valid contract with you and if I haven't and if you can't prove that I have then uh, we are agreed to the following terms and we send out a series of letters about 10 days apart so uh, uh, but it's you know it tends to prove to be very successful what it was uh, I used the method myself uh, quite a few years ago and was astounded how easily uh, that actually these companies just gave up. And so all I did, I got a website together and actually shared this information.
getoutofdebtfree.org is a site that has been set up to help people dealing with the agony of debt and the template letters just need you to adjust a few details and they're ready to go. Get Out of Debt Free has already helped thousands of people to get out of debt and the combined amount of money saved so far is over 12 million pounds and that's just from the people who have reported their success to the site. The forum is a large part of the site and is broken down into different sections such as bailiffs, debt collectors, credit card companies, etc. It is full of people who will fall over themselves to help you and with a wealth of knowledge and experience who will make sure you are not alone. So the important thing is that you have to keep hitting the ball back in the net. Uh, what you're doing, whatever they send you, you have to reply to it and send it back. Now, after you've sent them the three letters, also what's included in the letters are a fee schedule. And the fee schedule says, well, look, every time you send me a letter, uh, you know, if we can't agree, you know, if you can't prove that I owe you anything, then we're going to agree to the following terms. And, you know, you don't call me anymore. And if you do, it's going to cost you this much. And every time I have to write a letter to you, it's going to cost you this much. So what you do, you send them the fee schedule. And of course, if they do send you anything or contact you, you then start totting it up. And after a while, what you do, you send them an invoice. And uh, if they don't pay the invoice, you can then get onto the uh, small claims court online and actually start you know, pursuing them for the money. So you know what you've got to think is, the only power they have over us is fear. Now, when the fear goes and you start challenging them, you know, do, do you think they really want to like, deal with you? If you're going to be invoicing, when there's all these people go, oh, like I was, really nervous, and they're going, all oh, right, well, I should owe them some money, to get to the stage where, no, hang on, mate, you, you've actually sent me three letters. I actually charge 500 pounds a letter now, that's 1,500 quid, plus the two phone calls at 100 pounds, so that, yeah, we're up to about 1,800 quid. So, uh, yeah, basically, when are you going to pay? How are you going to pay? Debt collectors, really, the common term that's used for them is a third party intervener, which is you have an arrangement or you had an arrangement with an organisation. Because that organisation have contracted with a third party, which is the debt collector, there's some implication that you have to deal with them. You don't. Nobody has any, you, don't, you have no obligation to deal with them whatsoever, and they know it really. It doesn't matter how well they've been empowered by their company, you have no need to deal with them whatsoever. And as long as you're firm and clear about that from outset, then your relationship should, should go a little bit smoother. The other thing I would say is, first of all, in any interaction with any debt collector, at your first communication, let them know that uh, <laughs> you don't want to have anything to do with them for whatever motives or morals or ethics you feel. But also let them know that any future time they take of yours will be charged. And let them know that that is the terms of your engagement with them. And you can set your charges as you see fit. Now one of the things that, um, that people often miss when, uh, when the debt collectors come knocking is that these debt collectors have actually paid off your, your debt. They've bought your debt. Um, often for you know pennies on the pound, so if you if you apparently owe a thousand pounds, yeah, they've they've probably paid a, a tenner for it. Um, so, but the, the point is, they've paid off your your debt. So, you know, thank you very much. You know, um, did I did I actually make go into contract with you to say that I'd pay you back for for that? You know, you should have probably asked me first before you went around paying off my debt for me. You know. So where, where's the fear in that? You know, the, these guys rely on 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 fear to to you know to make you pay up. Um, if you realise that they've got no power over you, and in fact they've paid off your debt, thank you very much. You know, where's the fear? All you're asking from them is an invoice for the amount they say you owe. Yeah, and nothing comes back. Well, they can't, they can't supply. What we're asking for, they can't supply. And we know they can't supply that. But uh, we, we ask mm. for a, a contract. Uh, I mean, we, we also use contract law because that mm -hmm. goes back years. Uh, and it's how we, we would deal with each other. Mm -hmm. But we say, you know, can you give us a copy of the contract signed by both parties? 
Mm -hmm. And sometimes uh, on loans you'll get a little squiggle, but no mm -hmm. name against it. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, because they are a fictitious entity mm -hmm. and we are a, a living, breathing soul, mm -hmm. we cannot contract under contract law with a with fictitious entity. So it's got to be equal to equal, really. It has. Yeah. That's what and, the and that uh, contract, and that's what contract law says, yeah. Debt collectors have no rights of entry. If they turn up at your door, they can only negotiate how you will pay, nothing more. If they make threats pertaining to more power than they actually have, then they are breaking the law. Normally sending the three letters as described in the previous section, plus an estoppel is usually enough and it works in nearly all cases. If an agent of a debt collection company turns up at your door, you do not have to deal with them unless you want to. The best thing to do is to not open the door and wait until they go away. If you open the door, go outside and close the door behind you. Take your phone and film the encounter. Tell them you do not want to deal with anyone at the door or over the phone, only by post. Ask them to leave your property and if they don't or make threats, call the police. They will have no warrants, so the police must ask them to leave as it is a civil case. They have no power, only empty threats. We deal with bailiffs quite differently from how we deal with debt collectors. So if bailiffs suddenly say, oh, we want some money, uh, the first thing we would do is, uh, it, it, you know, if they normally they contact you by post first. Uh, and we would just make a differentiation. We're talking about not court, court bailiffs, but we're talking about private bailiffs. And so for banks and things like that, it's always uh, private bailiffs. So court bailiffs are a little bit different and a little bit specialised. So, uh, but if you're dealing with debts, as you know, and the, the website is, uh, we'd be talking about private bailiffs. Now, the thing is, they actually have very, very few powers, if any. So the first thing you do, you send them a removal of implied rights of access. So you send them a document you can download off the website, which removes their implied rights of access. Now, th what you're doing, you're removing that common law right from the bailiff to be on your property, which means that if, as soon as he sets foot on your property, uh, then he's committing a trespass, which you can then, you know, you can then sue him for. So you make that very clear to him. You can then put that notice on, on the door or on a window so that it's visible when they actually come onto your property. That's the first thing you do. Uh, it's a good idea that everything you do, if they actually turn up at your property, the first thing you do, ideally if you've got a front and back door, you'd go out the back door, lock it behind you, okay, and then go round to the front and meet the bailiff. Make sure you have a camera at all times and view everything. Notepads are great. Uh, if you have a notepad and a pen as well, you know, if there's two of you, one with a notepad and a pen, another with a camera, it, it automatically you're watching them, you, you know, they realise they're being challenged and uh, that, you know, they can't push you about uh, if, if you're recording everything. And you're well within your rights to do this. The other thing you ask them uh, with the bailiffs, you always ask them, uh, can I see a signed warrant from the court? Now, it has to be signed by an actual judge, not signed by anyone else. It is very unlikely they will have this. Uh, unless they have this and give it to you to read and you can then read it through and take notes. Uh, but you, you can then say, right, I then want to contact the court and actually ensure that this person that signed it is in fact who they say it is. Otherwise you're here you know, under false pretenses and this is fraudulent. Very often, it's very rare that they actually have anything signed by a judge. So gentlemen, there's bailiffs on the doorstep. Uh, the concept of illegal debts and how you actually deal with them when they're on your doorstep. So who'd like to take that? Well, first thing you've got to understand is that the standard bailiffs have no power whatsoever. They will tell you they can come in your property whenever they want and remove property. They mm -hmm. cannot. They're right. like vampires. You have to allow them in once. Mm -hmm. If you've allowed them in, they can come back and possibly break into your property and remove it. If you don't let them in in the first place, there's nothing they can do. Mm. My son was dealing with a, a particular uh, bailiff called Equita, 
who were threatening to come around and remove his property. And he showed me the letter and he got a little worried because it says, we would prefer you to be there, but if you're not, we will remove property anyway. Um, and just to put his mind at rest, I actually phoned up the bailiff and stated that they'd said they were going to come and remove property, to which right. they replied, yes, we can le legally come and remove property because uh, once we've had a walk-in possession order. Now, a walk-in possession order is when they've actually walked into your property and started jotting down what you've got. Right. If you never let them in the first place, they can't get in. And the bailiff admitted that if we've not, not entered your property, we cannot get in. Mm -hmm. they, one of the tricks they will do is try pushing past you. Right. If they touch you, that's assault. Call the police. What, just touching you? Touching you is assault. Okay. So they can't push their way in, force past you, that's assault. If they do that, call the police there and then. And they, they will back off and also threaten them with a Form 4 uh, warning, which you can send off to the, the, their uh, sophistic certificating um, court right. and they basically could lose the job for that. Right, you you want to film this please? That's Don't assault. strap me. I'm not obstructing you. Right. Show us the warrant. Give us the keys. Show yeah, us the, the warrant. Let me have a look at the warrant. It. You, you, can nine, you can see please. it. 999. <laughs> nine, nine. You're not going in without a warrant. You don't what show you, me what they're doing. I've been just did. Yeah, well you're wrong. I'm wrong am I? What am I wrong about? Where's your warrant? Go away. There. Your, you're you're lying. Away. Look, you got, can you, you see that? Let me have a look at the warrant. No, you're doing. There. Are you doing? Are you trying to be stressed, heavy here or something? Are you no, trying no, to intimidate no, me? No, you know what you're trying to do? You said six times, times can I see the warrant? There is no, no, no. fucking warrant. I want to see the warrant. Oh, Hand me the warrant. Oh, you're not you are here. And of course, they can't break into your house. That's, that's the other thing. Everyone thinks, well, they can't. You can let them in. Once you've let them in, uh, basically, they can then go in again. But what you do, you do not let them in. You make sure the house is locked at all times. Except for an exceptional circumstances listed here, criminal court fines, income tax, or if it's a business, can reasonable force be used to gain entry, but only as a last resort and only after all other avenues have been exhausted. The wording here is reasonable force. Bailiffs cannot use force against a person and it states it here in Schedule 12 of the Control of Goods Act. And here in the Criminal Law Act 1997. And on the gov.uk website. The problems arise when bailiffs do not understand their powers and misinterpret the words of the acts, which is easy to do as they are so complicated. Bailiffs tend to pick the parts of certain acts that suit them best. A prime example of this is when the police attend and the bailiff shows them a court warrant, walking possession order, or something of that nature, and then they show this part of Schedule 12 of the Taking Control of Goods Act, where it states it is an offense to obstruct a bailiff the police will state that they are there to prevent a breach of the peace and if you obstruct the bailiff, they will arrest you to prevent that breach of the peace. This can be broken down to a tail of the tape to show the position of each person in the situation. You, a living, breathing human being. Human rights are absolute, only unto the law. You are man or woman, the highest authority. You are trying to protect your property. The bailiff works for a corporation, has a fictional title and is representing a fiction. No rights to use force against a human, has some sort of court order. The police officer is a public servant. You are the public and the bailiff is not. They're there to prevent a breach of the peace. Many encounters have ended with the police siding with the bailiffs and acts of violence or arrest being made on the debtor all because of a major misunderstanding on behalf of the police. Here's why. We have shown that force cannot be used to collect a debt except in exceptional circumstances. A bailiff cannot use force on a person. If you are standing in front of your door and peacefully resisting, they cannot move you out of the way. For an arrest under the prevention of a breach of the peace, there are plenty of case laws that show the aggressor is the one to be arrested. 
The main definition comes from R. V. Howe, 1981, and the following next four case laws define who is to be arrested to prevent a breach of the peace. You cannot be obstructing a bailiff from his duties, as using force on a human is not his duty. It seems trivial, but the law allows you to peacefully resist the possession of your home or property. If the bailiff is there for a debt or a non-criminal fine, such as a speeding ticket or parking ticket, then it is a civil matter and the police must be impartial no matter what the paperwork says. R. V. Howe, 1981 and Bibby, the Chief Constable of Essex Police, 2004, are now held as the authority for defining a breach of the peace. The main one to remember is the threat must come from the person to be arrested. That means if a bailiff tries to touch you or move you out of the way, they are the one to be arrested. You committing trespass and fraud and theft of people. That's what you do for a job, and you should be disgusted with yourself. That's what you do for a job. You're a thief. Go away, you ain't having it. Too many fucking massive here today and more coming down. The moment I hear you start, the, uh, they're all completely well. protected. We do want to be from the street. Grab off the firm. Because we got the firm. Look how many fucking people. Yeah, yeah we got the firm. I, 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 I,
Thank you very much, Constables. Absolutely, you're going to be heroes online. Absolute heroes. Well done. Absolutely amazing work. You've just, just made history in this country. You've just made history in this country. In this society, there is no way of actually living free at this point. I've had the, um, the idea to um, find some land somewhere, um, you know, buy a piece of land and, and build my own house and live um, apart from the system. The system will not allow you to do that. They will come, come for you and kick you off your own land and, um, and force you to, to live the way they want you to live. What I, what I feel is quite important is people need to get educated. People need to start waking up and realise what's going on around them. Generally people tend to only um, give, a, give a damn really what's happening when it's actually on their doorstep and it's happening to them. Um, but unfortunately we can't, you know, we can't wait for that to happen. We need to realise that we're all one and the same. We all need to look out, for it, look out for each other and protect each other because we've got a system now that's been built up around us. We've got a corporate web uh, of an empire that's completely taken over every aspect of our lives. So. The people who are worried about debt, again, don't worry about it. You've got family, you've got kids, you've got real problems in life. Worry about those, you know, debt is not something to worry about. Fair enough, some people have mortgages. And, but again, as I said earlier, you, you start dancing with the devil, you're gonna get burnt, you know? You play with fire, you're gonna get burnt. You're gonna sign agreements that banks own your house, you're gonna get burnt if you don't pay that. But in terms of consumer debt, you know, personal loans, unsecured debt, fuck it. Yeah, you won't be able to get a mortgage for six years. And who's got enough money to save up to buy to, for a deposit for a mortgage anyway? I don't know. So, so just don't worry. Live in, live in love. Get out of debt free has, we've got one piece of the jigsaw. But there's so many things that need fixing on the planet, like health, education, law, everything. There's so many pieces. And I've been at, I think, eight different festivals this summer, and I've seen tens upon tens of, yeah, probably 50 different speakers. And all of them have got a little bit of the jigsaw. And I'm sort of just trying to see how together that we can build a new sort of reality based on fairness, you know, because when you realize that, hang on, they're, they're spraying stuff in the skies, they're putting stuff in our water supply, and you know, they're, they're cutting down rainforests, and these are all problems. Now, I've got the answer to one of these, but you know, to change a world, uh, we've got to sort out all these problems, I feel. The people stand above the government. The government stand above citizens. And in America, we've taken the term citizen from them, but citizenship was actually created with the abolition of the, the slave trade. And it was so that slaves could be given the same rights as the free people, but without the same power. So the citizens were always going to be ascribed their rights and responsibilities by the government. And it was so that they could keep a finger on the, the ex-slaves. You know, whereas that's now been applied to everybody everywhere. And now obviously you have good citizenship classes at school and citizenship is on the curriculum now. So all this is being not, in, not brought in for us. It's been brought in for a couple of generations time when it's totally normalized that everyone is a citizen who only has rights and responsibilities because the government gave them to them and the standing as the people will be long forgotten by them. The sadness of this is that there is a lot of people out there that are, are involved in the commercial constructs and are doing things every single day for one reason, that basically to survive. So they have to go to work every single day and know that what they're doing is not moral. But they have to do it because they feel that there is no other way they can support their families. They are taxed to the hill. Everything that they've got, they are threatened with its removal if they do not comply. That's a very, very sad situation because that means that the human being is being controlled by a construct and can't escape that construct. And it gets worse day in, day out. They want a way out. Ignorance is our fault. Not, not being up to speed with what's going on is, the, is our responsibility. We're giving our power away to people who are using it against us. People need to understand. People need to wake up to what's really, really going on before it's too late and stop looking at the mainstream media, 
Start looking at the mainstream newspapers, start looking at some information that, that, that's real and is relevant because otherwise we're all going to be microchipped, we're all going to be controlled, we can barely do anything now, having to ask the government for permission to, to protest against the government. Our freedoms are being taken away by the day and people are not noticing because they're being distracted with other things from religions, from TVs, from celebrity gossip. We need to be adults about it, we need to open our eyes and we need to really, really see what's happening. Otherwise, we're going to be in the middle of this new world order, this complete one system of control and we're all just going to be barcodes and, and that's, that's the way it's going and that is the, the true reality of, of, of the world that we're living in at the moment. Five years ago, when I was looking for letters to actually send to the banks, there was nothing on the internet. Nobody was like talking about this apart from Mary Elizabeth Croft who I based our letters on. And I thought, oh, this is wonderful. And I was thinking there must be template letters out there for, you know, after the book that she'd written. There was nothing. Now we've got websites and forums and loads of different letters out there for dealing with banks and debt collectors. You know, so that's how far in the last five years consciousness has shifted. People are waking up. Now when we hit the hundredth monkey effect, that's when everyone wakes up. It's like a, you know, a new film that's like no one has heard of and then suddenly it breaks through and everyone's talking about it. And I feel that people suddenly realise, my goodness, we've been had by the banks, the governments and the corporations. And with endless war, with endless poverty and you know, keeping us on that treadmill.
Thank you.